It's much better. Eh? So welcome. Uh, my name's Eric Chabel. Or I guess you wanted to do that, didn't you? Go ahead. This is Eric Chabel. I think uh, I think he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Please welcome him. Done this before. Um, I work at Red Hat. Been uh, been in uh, open source for probably twenty some years now. I'm older than I look. I'm told. Um, I've been at Red Hat ten years. This talk is very different from most of the stuff you've seen here. Well, I guarantee it's different than most of the stuff you've seen here. It's also something that I've only started doing the last couple of years. And it's been a, a, a featured keynote to open up conferences. Uh, for example, I was in Split, Croatia. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's like a vacation destination. Think of Greece, same idea. Um, and I was in the National Opera House on a stage. This is the coolest place I've ever talked. Uh, have you ever seen when they do those shows on TV like cabarets or comedians and it's all golden boxes and stuff around them? And it, that's what it was like. So I came out on stage and I was kind of like, I was kind of looking at everything more than they were looking at me. I was like, holy God, this is cool here. You can find that online. It's uh, pretty much the same title. It's on YouTube. You can, you can watch that a little bit. Or you can pay attention right now, whatever you want to do. Um, what we're going to talk about is kind of fuzzy stuff, right? This has got nothing to do with technical stuff. But every single one of you, and I should start with who are you, like who, who's a developer here? Who does nothing with technology at all here? Hey, there's always one. <laughs> uh, who, uh, who, who has been in uh, uh, technology or any kind of work around this area for, say, more than 10 years? Three, four, uh, five years? A couple of years? Who's a student? Okay, so see, so we got a nice mix of everything. And the funny part is what I'm going to tell you, what we're going to talk about, this applies to all of you, from the beginning all the way through. So let's ask a few more questions. Um, how many people here write? And I don't mean papers for your, pres for your, for your class or whatever, but blog posts. Uh, do they twist your arm to do it, or <laughs> is it a voluntary thing? <laughs> Um, has anybody here written a book? That's kind of way out there. I get that. Um, who's written an article in the last month? See how there's like no, oh, there's one hand. One hand only. So we've got probably, I'm just guessing, several hundred years of experience in this room working in IT or something related to that. And there's one person that shared something this last month. What's wrong with this picture? Where are we standing right now? We're in a university. What do we do here? We share. What am I doing right now? How many people here have given a talk in the last month? Ah, oh, that's a little better. <laughs> Why do you do that? To share something, right? When I did this as a keynote at a place, uh, it was a, a technical day for Red Hat. We had about 500 people in the room, and I don't think... When I asked about the age groups and the different uh, levels of experience, I think most of them were gray-haired old men that had been working a long time. And there was only three that raised their hands that even did any kind of sharing and, and reading and, uh, or blogging and stuff like that. That's criminal, right? You don't want to be the old guy in the corner at some place like a bank that has the seat molded to his butt and does not share anything because that's job security. You ever heard the phrase, uh, security through obscurity? That's awful. That's not what you want to do these days, right? Where do you think open source comes from? Sharing. When you look at anything, and, and I've been living this since day one. I got really lucky. I went in, uh, uh, I'm from America originally. I was in the military, got out overseas, stayed in Holland. Uh, met a girl, that's why I ended up there. I studied there. Uh, my teacher was Tonnenbaum. Heard of him? So he does this thing around Minix and operating systems, but you can't really install it anywhere because there's no TCP IP stack. So we use Linux a long time ago. That's how I got into it. And from that point on, everything I did, I shared, and it's open, and you can always find the problem. You can always go further. All those things you always hear about code and stuff. So I basically applied that to everything I do. And the best day of my life was when Red Hat called and said, hey, you want to come work on open source? I'm going to get paid to work on open source. When I tell people what I do, we sell free software. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like, think about this. These are, these are not oxymorons. 
What we're going to talk about today is three things. First of all, you. I've already started poking. But it all starts with you. Everything about what's going to change in your life needs to happen now, and it comes through you. Right? It has nothing to do with anything else. I don't care how cool the software is. I don't care how cool the company is. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. So remember that. Second thing is, really easy, sharing. How old are those two kids right there? That's where it started. Trust me, you've been sharing since you were very, very small. Why'd you stop? Society isn't mine, mine, mine. Is it? Is it? I don't know, in America, maybe it is now. Um, and it's about growth, huh? It's about growth. It's an easy path. It's really easy. Trust me. So, when we look at you, I've asked a few questions already. I can't stress enough. Wherever you work, I don't care whether it's an open source or a closed source or a super private IP company or whatever. You have colleagues next to you. You have colleagues behind you. You have bosses. You have kids at home. You have days at schools where you can talk about your job with your kids, right? You have all kinds of places you can share. Do you do that? You have pizza evenings where you guys hack at work. Heard of those things? Meetups? You got to go to a meetup? Have you presented at a meetup? I don't care what you do either. I don't care if you're a manager. I don't care if you're a lawyer. I don't care. You know lawyers at Red Hat actually do stuff like this? It's really funny. It's like watching a, a turtle come out of its shell. They're really, really not about sharing, right? <laughs> then they got to come out and explain all these really complex laws to us about the IP and what these new things mean. And blah, 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 blah. Everybody, I don't care what you do, has something to share. If you've done anything, even as a student, if you've been programming for three months. You've been playing with some library that I know shit all about. So tell me about it. Write about it. Tweet about it. Whatever you guys are doing. Snapchat about it. It's whatever it takes. I mean, it's it's so ridiculously easy. So these, I've, I never, never thought in my life I'd be giving this talk at a university. So it's really funny when I put this up because, yeah, you remember university? Yeah, yeah, yesterday. <laughs> So it all started here huh? when you're kind of like that original curiosity, everything's new, everything you're running into, and in my case, open source quite quickly. Everything I was doing was like Google something, look for it online, find somebody's blog. You never know what you share is going to hit somebody or go crazy or go ballistic. Anybody know what Slashdot is? I don't know if that's still a thing over here, is it? Is it still kind of active? or It used to be huge, right? It used to be the thing. Um, I did a very small Linux install course. I don't remember what version it was. Walking through some really stupid, easy stuff. Put it online. Somebody slash dotted me. Um, didn't know what that was at the time either. Uh, but my website is being hosted by Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. <laughs> and a little company that had two servers. And on the server where mine was, was also the two biggest new sites in Holland. And they crashed it because they didn't use caching. So we're talking like gigabytes per second or whatever of traffic, and it just completely hoses the server, and then that means the new sites were also offline because it was a mess. Everything you're doing in the beginning is learning from other people. Imagine if nobody shared shit. Their first experience would be looking at a blank screen. It used to be like that, huh? Anybody remember buying Microsoft products in a box? Yeah, you got a CD and a book, and good luck. Really, that's all it is, right? Is that how you want life to be? Not me. Everything I have, you can shoot, you reuse, share, and do anything you want to. So I hammer a lot on the, on the word open source, but apply that to everything, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a religion. Do I look like I'm not showering and, you know, <laughs> living in the woods and, you know, trying to get off grid and all that kind of crazy shit? No. I mean, I have an iPhone. <laughs> I want stuff that works, right? Um, open source is about getting into that mindset and realizing that sharing is caring, right? It's really that simple. The more open stuff is, the more standardized stuff is, the better we're all off. And time and time again, we learn that. Who here remembers when containers started? There was one container engine. What was it called? You're not that old. Come on. Yes. Docker, right? Anybody here work for Docker before a hammer on your company? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing um, they came out with whatever they're doing with these containers, right? That shit took off like a bottle rocket. Everybody was on that one. That was it. It's a really good lesson on how not to do it. 
What's the first thing that starts happening when somebody gets a little bit of a disagreement with a company that owns technology like that? It's time to make a standard. Now we have an open container initiative, OCI. That means we define how an engine is supposed to work and people program an engine based on the standard. Now you can use whatever the hell you want. And Docker's becoming irrelevant as the only tool set to manage your containers, right? There's a little bit more behind that story. Google the shit online, you can figure out why they blew it. But they tried to open source, but then only little pieces, and that's not really sharing. That's just trying to manipulate. People aren't stupid. There's people much more religious about this than me, and it all goes sideways. So in the beginning, you're digging around trying to become professional, right? Trying to become a, anybody here a programmer? That's fun, huh? What are you other guys doing? You're missing out on all the fun. <laughs> Um, I started pretty late at school. I think I was 28 when I first started studying for my master's. I hadn't touched a computer at all. I was a Marine, so that should tell you kind of where my mindset was, right? How I got into computers was more of an accident than anything else. But the thing that caught me was day one, I knew I was in the right class because we were programming. And there's nothing cooler than trying to solve those puzzles, right? It's some freaky language. You don't know how to do anything. It's really, really cool. But then all of a sudden you're going to roll out of school for the people that haven't done it yet and you start getting, anybody done like part-time jobs in a real company? <laughs> they come in there and they say, hey, write a web service. You're like, oh yeah, I can do that. I do that on my laptop all the time. But you do that in a company, what happens? It's a whole different ball of wax, so much more complicated. You got all these buzzwords, containers, all kinds of stuff. Uh, my first job out of school was at IBM, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> part-time. And I only did it because I expensed my school. Uh, you got to understand school in Holland is about 3000 a year. So I got lucky doing school over there and not doing it in this building. <laughs> no debt. Um, I was expensing my school and my books and working part-time. And it was a DB2 uh, uh, logistics uh, area of IBM. We're talking about tables with, like, if you do a join, it is so big. It's worldwide to parts and stuff. It's so big that it does not come out of the printer. And you're like, what happened? And then tomorrow a truck shows up with all these boxes of the shit you tried to print out because it goes to a bulk printing station someplace. And everybody in your, your department knows this. These are older guys. And they just laugh at you because then you come in, your desk is covered in these boxes of printouts. <laughs> and I'm shitting myself thinking I'm going to get fired for spending all that money on paper. You program something and you, you push it to dev and it disappears. It's not on your screen anymore. It's gone. I mean, this is how complicated things are in real life, right? It gets way more complicated. So you're constantly learning, constantly trying to prove yourself. Anybody here that's been doing IT for a while, have you ever stopped learning? Why are you here on a Saturday? I'm impressed. This is the busiest room I've seen so far. You guys are the only smart ones. This is the best session you're going to see. I'm not kidding. I mean, it's based on feedback. If you take what you hear today, continue to do this, you're going to be highly successful. You're going to get job opportunities and stuff that you never thought you'd get. I don't go hunting jobs. People come to me. You know why? Because I share, push out there, and if you Google stuff, people find you. You help people. That's why people want to be nurses and doctors and things like that. It's not to be a famous nurse and doctor. It's to help people. Right? Nothing makes me happier than someone sends me a little email or a note and says, oh, that's great. Thank you. You saved my ass. Tell you a really funny story. I've been doing it for a while, uh, working in the middleware BU of our company, doing uh, BPM and BRMS mostly. So that's business rules, uh, business processes, that kind of stuff. I'm a huge fan of the very simple, basic steps first. How do you install it? How do you start it? How do you make a project? How do you make you know your first code, your first deployment, all that kind of stuff? So I fill all these buckets. This means that our sales guys can go out. They don't even have to go out. The customers find this stuff, play with it, and then come to them. I had not gone down to South America because I live in Europe, and that's a long flight to go down there and, like, train people and do stuff. And who doesn't want to go to Brazil? Who doesn't want to go to Peru? Who doesn't want to go? So all the other people on my team wanted to go. I said, go ahead. I'll just stay home. So I didn't go for about five years, and they kept coming back and telling me, hey, they're really, really, really big fans of you down there. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're just jerking my chain. And I finally went down after about eight years. And the whole team of SAs met me at the door. And in South America, they're a little bit more uh, warm, I guess you could say. And men, when they greet each other, they kiss on the cheek, at least in Brazil when I was there. 
And uh, they, they were lined up waiting for me at 7 in the morning to all one by one hug me and say, I, you saved my ass so many times. That makes my day. You know what I'm saying? You don't need to pay me. Do that. That's really, really fun. Okay. So what do you want to do with this uh, IT stuff, right? And I don't think just constantly learning new technology is exactly why you're in it. Is it? You want to be rich? Are you all working at an IP, looking for the IPO and cash out and go live on an island? That would suck at 28, wouldn't it? <laughs> you want to build cool shit, right? And finally, I get to use this slide in Boston. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big Red Sox fan. I played baseball my whole life. I write for a fan blog. Not so much anymore. I'm a little too busy, but I really like it. I was there last night. Great stuff. They suck this year, I know, but whatever. And you want all the coolest tools, right? You want to do all the fun stuff, and you want to have the coolest toolbox. And you want the playground to play, and you want to be able to use all these nice little tools and these open source things, right? Right? No? I see the stickers on all your stuff, huh? But most importantly, you want to have impact. So that's what I've been descri describing. Whether my impact is based on software I wrote, I have no illusions. There's no software I'm writing that's even going to live past three years old, probably. Ah, one exception. One exception. I worked at a bank in Holland, and I wrote one of my first services there uh, was a post uh, zip code check. It's one line. <laughs> you can't optimize this. And really funny enough, one of my friends who used to work with me there went to a, a outsource company outside and got hired back in like five years later. I was digging around and found our original 1.0 document for that. They're still using my service, and my name's still on it. So maybe, just maybe, if the bank doesn't die, there might be something floating out there for me a while. All right. So that's about you guys and where you're going and what you're looking to do. Now, how are we going to do it? It's very, very, very easy. You've been doing it since you were this big. Just share. You guys have, if you have, does anybody here have a blog themselves? Someplace you consistently write at or whatever? What's the copyright on that? Do you know? Do you care? <laughs> you just steal shit everywhere and publish it? or? <laughs> um, I've said it before, right? Open starts with you guys. It's, it's about how you want to position what you're doing. Uh, if you look at the bottom of my website, my blog or whatever, since day one, I've had like this Creative Commons. That's the most, uh, it's in the art section. It's, it's meant to cover art originally. Um, but writing, I guess, falls under artistic stuff. And I want it as free and as open as I can get it. And that's as far as I can get it, I think. It can be reused, copied, mangled, whatever the hell you want to do. I don't care. Everything I've done since 2005, I guess. Have fun. Tear it up. It's fine with me. When you look at where you work, not everybody has the luxury of what we do at Red Hat where it's like it's a thing. So how many people here work in a company that's got more than 10,000 employees? Now, keep your hands up. That's three of you. All right? Now, of you three with or four with your hands up, how many of you have written an email telling your CEO directly he made a mistake? More than once. Huh? Red Hat is a meritocracy, they call it, and it's just like open source. Anybody ever worked on an open source project? Somebody doesn't like what direction it's going, they all jump in and tell you how shitty your decision is, right? Sometimes not very nicely, but most of the time it's not too bad. Most of the time it's not too bad. That's exactly what it's like inside of Red Hat, believe it or not. Uh, our whole company functions like, and th this blew my mind when I came in, I subscribe to probably about 50 mailing lists because everything in my company runs like an open source project, so everything's a mailing list. Um, people are not afraid to tell somebody when they make a decision whether you're a leader or whether you're not a leader. And it's quite shocking. It's quite funny to watch somebody come in from Oracle and be put in a director's position, make a decision, and I was standing in, a, in Boston at the Heinz Convention Center having coffee with him because he's thinking before I go to the airport, I'm going to tell him he's got to line up and do what I told him to do. And I look him in the eye and tell him, you're making a fucked up decision. <laughs> and they're like, 
And I'm like, dude, if you want to fire me, fair enough. But that's, I'm calling bullshit. You know, it's, it's, and I'm not egotistical. Don't get this wrong. I'm not better than anybody else. That is not what it's about. It's a bad decision. You know, and I wasn't the only one telling him, which is funny. He just keeps hearing the same thing all the time, right? It's a good one for you to use. Eh? <laughs> These are some of the things you'll find on our walls and all our offices. So it's hard not to be motivated at work when you see stuff like this, right? And I could talk about it now. IBM just bought us, right? They bought us very carefully. What do we own? Nothing. No buildings, no software. Nothing. Every patent that's been done by somebody from us goes into the patent pool where everybody shares. It's protected. The only thing they own is the people that are still working there. They paid $34 billion for us, right? Sounds nuts, right? They'll probably earn that back on us in about five, six, maybe seven years. It's not so crazy then, is it? But they're risking one-third of their shit to get our stuff because of these ideas, because of the way we work inside. They're doing all they can not to change us, not to merge us, not to acquire us, not to have too many of the IBMers get involved and mess it up. They want our culture to remain the same. They want our culture to spread. I don't know what it's going to result in. Maybe it's all crap and in two years I'm not working here no more. <laughs> or somebody else has you know, destroyed Red Hat. But you don't even see IBM as a company of, you know, Red Hat a company of, I've, nothing. Nothing has changed. Same HR, same everything. It's crazy. My favorite, because we could put a big old exclamation point at the end of this. You know, it's kind of how it works. Who doesn't run into open source in their companies now? It's pretty weird if you're a CIO and not doing open source at all. It's just not happening. And that is so different from ten, even 10 years ago when I first started. You know, 90% of my, I was a solutions architect the first three years in Europe. 90% of my discussions are about trying to convince you why you shouldn't be using community stuff. Because I went through it at the bank. We did our first implementation with community stuff, tried to do the second implementation, updated one component, and all kinds of crap breaks. Who hasn't gone through that in an architecture yet, besides the students? Wait till you get out there. It sounds like a good idea at the time, but when you get to actual enterprise stuff like what, uh, what you're doing in organizations, it gets complicated and has legacy stuff. It's really nice to have components that are open source that are stable for three years, right? That is guaranteed the APIs aren't going to change, that uh, developers can count on that and continue to program against that, and everything I deploy still works. The libraries don't get flipped the next release. So, as you're growing, as you're sharing, you start bridging the gap to these people. Huh? You're going to start noticing that you're basically a teacher. Everybody should be a teacher. I don't care whether you're teaching about how to underwater basket weave, because that's your thing. Bicycling, baking cakes, it really doesn't matter. Look at YouTube, man. Every kid in the world thinks he's going to be a rich YouTuber because they're sharing about how to put on makeup at 12 years old. Maybe so, you know. But they're doing the same thing. It's absolutely viral, right? So why, why aren't you guys doing it? Watch your kids, man. I'm not saying put your bank account online. There's, there's a limit to what you want to share. But it's really up to you. It's really, really up to you. I can say this all day long, and you go back home and you do nothing different than you did yesterday. Nothing's going to change. It's really funny. I can tell in this talk there's almost nobody like in their phone and not paying attention. Everybody's looking at me. So you're all thinking about it. I'm like, shit, this is so obvious. So here's some uh, tips along the lines of how do we do this sharing and stuff. Write, write, write. I don't care if you don't like it or not. Keep trying. And you know what's great about this stuff when you want to do a blog or whatever or medium.com or any place you want to put this stuff? You don't have to write a book. Nobody's going to read any farther than one screen anyway. So make it fit. If you got more to say, make it part two, part three. Now you got three articles. Plan them over the next three weeks. You get a fourth article you've now written for a month. See how that happens? It's real easy. I have a... Uh, so after they crashed my blog with uh, uh, Slashdot, I went over to Google's blogger thing just because they're the best at hosting all the shit and caching and stuff and SEO, and I don't have to worry about it and manage it myself. All I want to do is write. 
So anytime I have an idea, I open up a new article, I put draft at the beginning, maybe whip out a quick title, maybe paste a link in, and I'll come back to it later. That's just my bookmarks for ideas to write about. I always have about 8 to 10 rolling at any one time. Right now I have, well, right before this started, all these slides will be available. They went online 10 minutes before we started. That was stage stuff I put up before. Right? I knew I was going to publish that stuff. That is not all of it, but that's all that would fit on the screen. You can see the number of blogs I did per or articles I did per year. I'll be honest, it all started out as me being a developer and just bookmarking work that was so complicated I didn't want to go look for it again. Still one of my top three uh, uh, visited uh, articles. You never know. You never know when you put something online what it's going to be. Maybe nobody looks at it. Maybe it becomes a, the most famous thing you've ever written. I was working on a piece of code. It's two classes. One class basically takes any object you give it, zips it up, and puts it in a database. So it's serializing, they call that. And then you have to unserialize and unzip it when you take it out so you can use it in your code. Those two things are the top three. People are still looking that up. That was based on JBoss code from like 4.1 or something. We are so far beyond that. We're like at 8 now or something. I, I can't imagine what people are doing with that code. I hope they're not running JBoss 4. Anyway, um, another stupid one was fixing uh, WordPress would give me a blank screen at some point, and it was some stupid version, and it was a bug, and if you did something with a flag, it would fix it. People are pounding that, pounding that. How to make an ESO uh, to burn, remember burning stuff to CDs? <laughs> Somewhere in that crap, probably way back by 2008 and seven, is an article about how to do that on a Mac. I got my first MacBook and I was playing around with it and couldn't figure it out and command line to do all that shit properly. Those are my top three. Stupid. <laughs> Just never know. Never know. But I don't have to look all over the internet to find the stuff I was doing at the time. I could Google what I was looking for plus my name and it'd pop up on my site. So that's pretty cool. But you'll see later here, about 2011, 2012, then it starts getting focused. And that's a tip I can give you up ahead of time. I was all over the place in the beginning. I was writing about cycling that I was doing. I was writing about baseball. I was writing about all kinds of crazy stuff. There's no coherency there. You're not going to get an audience. It's kind of chaos. Um, so from 2011, 12, if you look at the top of my site, it says very distinctly in the small description what I talk about there, and that's all I talk about there. If you want to talk about baking, which really doesn't apply to IT, make a baking website. It's a lot easier for everybody to find and to focus on what you're doing. Same thing for your social media. I have like four Twitter accounts because some of them are baseball, some of them are, that was a really bad experience. I started writing I think around 2013 when they won the World Series. I did it on the one that was already famous for all the IT stuff. Uh, had about 5,000 followers on Twitter. You post a photo that's really nice of Fenway Park with a sunset and you don't realize how big the Red Sox nation is worldwide. It's huge. It's like within five minutes you have 200,000 impressions or something on that. That's great when a game's going on, but then all the IT people are like, what the hell is this? And then when you go back to talking about the other stuff, <laughs> then the baseball people are like, what's this? So I kind of mishmashed it all and then later pulled it apart. So that's a tip. Focus on what you're going to talk about. Um, anything you're writing about or reading about or working on doesn't require you to write an article. Like if you're right now coding in my class on something here, or in my session, um, and you're, you're thinking this is kind of cool, you can put a little thing on Twitter and say, this is a link to the code I just wrote. I'm going to publish it later. You know, Every week you are doing something that somebody probably could read about, even if it's just 100 characters. Not everybody has time to write every week. I get that. Maybe some people don't like to. Maybe you write in other languages. I have somebody I know that writes... Japanese for me. <laughs> he takes my stuff because he doesn't want to generate the content, but he does know how to do the Japanese. So I let him translate the stuff and just put a link in. And pretty soon before you know it, you start getting crazy stuff like this where people are just like, oh, I love all your stuff. Um, maybe, and th this is an example I use from some internal stuff we have. We generate like t-shirts with, uh, with uh, slogans on them and stuff, stickers that you see on the laptops. But maybe your thing is podcasts or YouTube videos sitting down and talking about stuff. I mean, there's nothing you can't come up with that you can't use to share. There's all kinds of mediums. Maybe Instagram is your thing. 
There's people that are millionaires on there. I don't know how they're doing it, but if you could figure that shit out, you wouldn't be here listening to me, right? We'd all be off riding in your Ferrari. All right. So we talked about you. We talked about sharing. This is where it leads to the growth. I already mentioned one, one growth aspect here is you're going to get some recognition around that you're an expert in a topic. Whether you're an expert or not, that really doesn't matter. That's a relative term. But you're somebody willing to share the experience for good or bad. Um, and anybody you're helping to get further along in what they're doing, that's the growth. You're a teacher. You let your kids run across the street in traffic? Why do you let the developer sitting next to you at work do the same thing? Right? It's, it's, it's a mindset. It's just, there shouldn't be this fear that if I help him, he's going to go past me. You know the fastest way to promotion? is make everybody look good around you. Seems weird, doesn't it? It's worked for me. You don't climb over people. You lift them up. It's a completely different philosophy. It's got nothing to do with socialism. It's got nothing to do with uh, communism. <laughs> right? It's not political. There's no need to be. People that act like that shit, they always get bit in the ass eventually. Right? I can sleep at night. I can look in the mirror. So, you've been here for three days. Three days. You, I, I assume you've been here three days. You guys been here three days or you just come on Saturdays? <laughs> That would be really hardcore. You blow off the weekend and just come on the weekend. How many people live local to Boston? Who drove more than an hour? Who had to fly to get here? Jesus, look at this. Very cool. That's dedication. <laughs> so, think about it. Think about sharing. Please, 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 please. I hope to read your shit one day, too. Right? Maybe help me figure out how to change the oil in my car. Third time you're seeing it, huh? That means you won't forget it ever. You share, grow. Very simple, very easy. Any questions? See, it's so shocking. Nobody has a question. They're all stunned. It's that easy. If anyone does have a good question, if you want to raise your hand, I'll get you the mic. Right here. Thank you. Or I can repeat his question. <laughs> yeah, um, while listening to you, I remember this part where you talked about um, subscribing to a number of mailing lists. So my question is, how do you keep up reading? Mail filters. Okay. And uh, <laughs> experience. <coughs> Over time, there's a lot of shit I don't read. So when I go on vacation, I put a note up because I read this once that I think Volkswagen does this. They automatically put you out of office to delete all email. They think that the health of the employee is important enough that you do not need to be coming back on Sunday night trying to figure out what your big pile of email is. If it's important, and everybody knows that in the company, so if it's really important, I'll get you again. So I put a really clear out of office message. When I'm gone, I'm gone. I'm, I'm deleting everything and reach out when I get back. It's worked for the last two years. Uh, mailing lists are, are filterable. So my inbox is, you, you're a pretty select person if you get into my inbox. So all that other crap can pile up and I can browse it when I got time. But it's a, it's a, it's a technique, yeah. It's an art form. <laughs> but it's open source, man. Keep doing it and you're going to keep doing it. You know, we, ha we have a one, one, one internal legendary artifact. It's called the memo list. Anybody that's Red Hatter's giggling right now, right? I shit you not, and most people don't believe this, I was on that thing one hour. You're automatically subscribed. Back when I joined, there was just over 2,000 employees. I was the 15th solution architect in EMEA. That shit was already off the rocker. I mean, like, within the first hour, I think I had 500 emails in that thing. And I'm not kidding. It's the hardcore Linux, I'm sorry, very deep, like, religious about stupid shit. I mean, it is unbelievable what they get pissed off about. It's embarrassing. And there's no filter. I mean, actually, this should be used to fight, figure out who you fire in the company, in my opinion. But that's not how it works. So <laughs> my opinion is one small opinion in all these people. Um, but I can unsubscribe. And I did. And I've never gone back and I haven't missed anything. 
we have in the JBoss side something called the core, which is the same idea, but it's like listening to the three-year-olds in daycare versus the intellectuals, right? They do complain about stuff, but it's based on things and it has, you know, discussions and that's stuff I can live with, and that's maybe 10 a month. It's a big difference, big difference. But the memo list, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, but I had a question regarding um, sharing stuff. Basically, if you have something radical or controversial to say about a topic, what if the company that you're working with doesn't try, doesn't like what you're writing about, or somebody from, somebody doesn't like what you've written in the past, and they come back to, to haunt you, to haunt you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there's a couple things there. One, if your company won't allow you, that's that's something you agreed to when you signed up there. Or they don't like what you're writing, or maybe you're talking about a software that. You're I am not a fan of anybody filtering my stuff. Um, but that also requires discipline and maturity on your part to not write like a juvenile child and call people names and you know what I'm talking about. Um, consider every email, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got early in my career was consider each email, each message you send in the company, whatever, as if it's gonna be on the front page of the New York Times. You do that and you'll be fine. You won't be on memo list, but you'll be fine. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody lets you. Uh, working at the bank was hard to do stuff like that when I was writing. They were pretty open about it. Um, but it's up to you what you want to do with it. I can't tell you to quit your job. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the easy way out. For me, personally, it's a hint I don't want to work here. Um, I've actually done job interviews where you sit down and based on the feeling I'm getting and the questions I'm asking, I mean, if you've been around a while, you know what you like. And when are we happiest at work? When we go to work with a smile, when we want to be there, when things are easy, when I can do a little bit of what I want to do and a lot of what they require me to do. And the more we can turn it the other way around, the better, right? If I like programming in Java, I don't want to do Perl. If I have to do 20% Perl and 80% Java, maybe I can live with that. But if it's 60-40 the other way around, I probably want to leave. So in job interviews, you start asking questions or when people approach me for stuff. I've actually twice uh, stood up in the middle of one and said thanks for the coffee and left. Completely freaked them out. They don't like it when people do that. But, and I'm not being arrogant. I'm not being an asshole. It's just we can better stop now. Think about the, the processes you go through for a job. If it's difficult already and you're not even in, imagine how messed up HR is already. It's just going to get worse. And if you think back for the experienced guys, that's proven out more times than not when you get into these jobs. So I don't mess with it anymore. Don't. It's not worth it. So I would say if it really makes you pissed off about that stuff, then don't. Um, sometimes you can arrange that stuff that you write on your time and don't use their hardware. Then they have nothing to say about it, right? But, I mean, you're all young, right? I don't know how many of your parents now have been putting you on Facebook since you were born. Um, there's people that are doing that. There's stuff out there now about you that maybe you didn't put there. And you do have to own whatever you write and is on the Internet forever and ever and ever. And your bare butt on spring break hanging off a bar is going to follow you for a long time. <laughs> you know, And writing really nasty stuff or making comments like who hasn't uh, seen uh, people getting in trouble for stuff they published. How many baseball players this last year that when they were 16 in high school said some racist shit in Texas? and are now being held accountable because Me Too is a big deal over here now. Guy missed the All-Star uh, game because of it. Are you accountable? Can somebody use common sense? If I was hiring somebody like that, I'd sit down and talk with them, and I don't think they should be held accountable their whole life for 16-year-old one statement on Twitter. You know what I'm saying? But that's me. Not all bosses are going to be like that. I can't warn you enough, man. Think before you push publish. <laughs> but... That being said, I mean, I have opinions on stuff, and I've published about them, and you know, I own them. That's what I think. I'm not abusive. I'm not a shock jock. I'm, that's not me. Maybe that's you. That could be your brand. See where it takes you. I mean, who's that guy in New York City, uh, the DJ, Howard Stern or whatever? He's like crazy out there, right? I mean, but he's that's his thing. He's doing just fine. Got more money than I do, probably. Whatever makes you happy. And that's, that's the big key thing on this. Uh, if you're sharing and you're helping people and you're doing what you love, paths will open up, and you get to choose between A and B. Pick one of the two and go. Don't look back. You ain't going that way.
Does that answer your question in a really long roundabout way? <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion. Huh? Anybody have an opinion on what he's asking? Here's your chance. Come on. <laughs> Share. Anything else? It's all common sense, really, right? I'm just sharing what I've gone through and what I've, you know, seen up close on the lucky path I've been able to take. You like it? Pretty sure you guys did. I've yet to have an audience watch this one and, like, be bored. It's really funny to watch your faces. You should stand up here and see how the reactions are going. <laughs> it's really cool. I mean, there's enough talks I do where you're talking about technology and half the people are in their laptop and shit like that. And it's really nice when you see something, you're touching a nerve on people that, it's helping them get to some place they need to be. I feel like this is pretty close. This is one of my favorites to do. Like it? Good. Any last minute comments? We've got like two minutes probably. Yeah, I had. I, I, that's another thing. Take this. Please, please take this. Um, if it talks 45 minutes, if your story is 30, take 30. Okay? Now let me go. Uh, if your talk is uh, two hours and uh, you use 15 minutes and let me go, but you've told your story, your audience is going to be so much more happier than that you're doing this crap and trying to look at your watch and stretch this shit out to 45 minutes. Okay? I almost never look at the, never look at the clock. I think my first talk today was about half hour, maybe. It was supposed to be longer, but I was done. And it's based on what your reaction is and what you guys are doing. I can't turn this into a whole discussion if you don't ask a question. Right? See? Boom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the titles are kind of funky, yeah? So, my real title is Consulting Level Technical Marketing, which is complete mumbo-jumbo. It's just something that they use in the hierarchy in there. Um, so, I use Global Technology Evangelist most of the time, but the last year and a half, two years, I've been doing a role that's called Portfolio Architect. And uh, what I do, basically, when I'm not doing this, is uh, kind of interesting. It's what uh, the solutions architect in the field don't have time to do and what consultants don't have time to do. They, they do engagements and do really complicated solutions with our technologies. For example, omnichannel integration. So integrating everything through their stack, microservices and all this stuff so they can talk to their customers and all their channels. That's pretty, pretty huge. They'll have a big repository of documents somewhere and then they move on. And the SAs don't know where those are and nobody can align three of these customers to look at how they did this with our technology. So that's what I do. So I took three different ones, a bank, an airport, and I forgot off the top of my head what the third one is. It's like a year ago. And I look at that and then turn that into a generic architecture with diagrams based on all three. So it's not any specific one, but it's generically how you do that so that then the solution architect can talk to a new person that's interested in this area or pieces of that architecture and have a you know, story around it to look at based on customers. So it's not, we like to say that there's a lot of marketing out there around products and solutions where people talk about all the cool shit they can do. This is fact-based. So nothing that appears in mind is marketing. So it's really funny, the reactions internally is all the marketing people are like, no, 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 it does this, it does that. My product doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is what your product does. <laughs> you want to market something else? That's fine with me. So that's what I do. Another long story short. Eric, do you really have another talk in like seven minutes? Oh, shit. Are we already over time? <laughs> yeah, I got to run to the next one, yeah. Now, that's your fault, man. You all put all my stuff in one day. So Thank you. So if you all want to run over to the other thing on the other side here, that, that thing there, we can do some fun stuff on stage and I'll actually code something for you. Yeah, I think that's the conference auditorium. Yep. So let's go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.